let's just wait for people to join in, attendees to join in, and then we can get started. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. I'm sure you've seen me many times uh, in these webinars. Today, we are here to discuss what helps keep waste and recycling collection workers safe. We have Megan Quinn, who's a reporter at Waste Dive. Uh, she's the moderator for this discussion. Megan has moderated another webinar on Be Waste Wise. Uh, you can find that on the video panel section of our website. Megan is going to talk to Marcy Goldstein Gelb. She's a co executive director at National Council for Occupation Safety and Health. And we have Christy Braham, who's a workers' health uh, coordinator for the social protection program at Vigo. As usual, we will be taking questions from you. Please drop the questions in the Q&A section. If it's not a question, if it's just a comment, please use the chat box. I will also share some uh, reporting that Waste Dive has done on collection worker safety by and large uh, on the chat box. So please feel free to bookmark it, read it later. Over to you, Megan. Well, thanks so much for making time for um, everyone to be here. I'm really excited um, to chat with you all about um, your expertises in your certain areas. And um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of give both of you a chance just to kind of give an intro of the things that you're working on in relation to um, waste recycling worker um, and waste picker safety and health. And um, just sort of the, the, the relevant pieces that, um, that you're working on currently. So um, Christy, do you wanna start with some of uh, what you're working on? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Christy Braham, um, and I'm the Workers' Health Coordinator at WeGo. Um, WeGo stands for Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. And we are a global research um, action network, um, whereby we, you know, we are a group of um, development specialists, trade unionists, activists, um, and community organizers um, across the world who focus on the informal economy um, and at we go we actually work with several different um, occupational groups within um, the informal economy and one of those um, groups is waste pickers or reclaimers as, as they're called in some in some places um, and a lot of my job is really around um, you know conducting research and um, managing advocacy campaigns around um, access to healthcare for informal workers, including waste pickers, um, and looking at issues around occupational health and safety um, that waste pickers and other informal workers face um, as a result of, um, of, of, the, of their working conditions, essentially. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do at WeGo. Great. Thanks. And uh, Marcy, what are, you, what are you working on? Tell us about. Hi. Well, so nice to be here and uh, with this wonderful team uh, to, you know, understand the work of COSH, which are coalitions for occupational safety and health. We're a federation across the U.S. of local and state coalitions with a common mission of ensuring every worker's right to earn their living without sacrificing their health, their well-being, their respect. Um, I want to introduce uh, one of our worker leaders, Mirna Santizo. Amirna came to Kosh after becoming sick while working at a recycling facility in Boston. She came to our Massachusetts Kosh group. And every day for 12 years, she told us, she sorted through bins full of garbage. She would find glass and needles. Sometimes the workers were punctured and hurt from the needles. They'd find dead animals in the bins and it stinks. There's, there's a lot of chemicals. Uh, it was also very, very hot. There wasn't much air circulation, she, she told us. She earned at the time, it was just a few years ago, $8.75 an hour. Um, the temporary workers who often dominate this industry uh, weren't even less. Many times these recycling workers earn just minimum wage. And the conditions that Mirna told us about were pre-pandemic. So just imagine Mirna and her coworkers tens of thousands of workers across the country working shoulder to shoulder in a space with poor ventilation in the middle of a pandemic. Um, workers like Mirna come to a Kosh group alone uh, or with a couple of coworkers with a great deal of fear, desperate because they need to pay their rent, they need to eat, and yet they need to work 
and and they're afraid of becoming ill. They're afraid of of losing their lives, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And many, many of these plants are not unionized, which means that without a union, they can't sit down at the bargaining table and talk about working conditions, talk about their wages, and even in many cases, just speak up about dangers or, or people becoming sick or, or injured. Um, so at Kosh, we bring workers together like Mirna because collectively they aren't alone. Uh, they recognize their leadership, they strengthen those skills, they build their power, and they develop a strategy. What is going to address uh, what they're facing on the job? And there's many levels, and we could talk more about that. You know, they have their particular employer, and how can they use their collective power to urge their employer in many ways to take action? Um, and we could talk about how they do that. And then looking even beyond their individual employer, what about recycling facilities across the region? What about across the country? Can Kosh groups and worker leaders work together to think about who actually funds, who pays for the work of these recycling facilities? And often in the United States, it is um, public agencies. You know, we certainly there's a, the private sector as well, but you have local government governments that are paying for these services and yet they're paying no attention to the working conditions. So there's lots to talk about, but that's sort of an overview. Great, yeah, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, and so, you know, Marcy, you're talking a lot about um, some of these conditions that at least in the US um, recycling workers are facing. And Christy, I'm curious um, from your perspective for the more informal uh, economy what kind of working conditions um, waste pickers are kind of generally facing um, when they do these jobs um, around the world? Sure. So, um, of course, um, it, you know, it really does depend on the context. Uh, um, at WeGo, we do have a very global outlook in general. So we do, you know, look at, um, I suppose, the similarities and differences um, between different working conditions in say India and Bangladesh, you know, to Senegal, South Africa, um, you know, Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, um, even New York City. Um, but I would say in general, um, from some of our observations um, pre-COVID, but also very much during uh, this current pandemic, uh, we hear a lot of, around, um, you know, not having access to clean water, um, you know, at a collection site or, if you're working um, at, um, it, you, know, in, in, you know, in the warehouse, um, you know, if you're in the landfill, we hear a lot um, about that. And that's, that's very much a common thread, um, you know, across many, many different working contexts. Um, you know, it's also around, you know, access to, to you know, other forms of sanitation, you know, toilets, um, you know, access to, yeah, just so many, so many different facets of of um, sanitation work, essentially, because um, for many waste pickers um, in different contexts, actually, um, you know, the work, work, the place of work is often uh, also the place of of residence. So many waste pickers actually live in in very close proximity to the places where they work. Um, so that also presents a range of issues. So if you know if you're working in in places where you don't have access to clean water, where you um, you know you really can be exposed to a range of infectious diseases, um, as well as um, other um, occupational issues, um, whether that's accidents, etc. You know th there is a you know th there is there is a very direct connection to the ways in which you live um, outside of your working hours and. And you know the impact of that on your general community. Um, so these are really, really big issues for for waste pickers. Um, but of course, you know it, it does vary depending on context. But the, these are in general the the sort of top level um, commonalities, I would say. Yeah, and in, in this context, it does kind of sound like some of these things are just like access to basic human health needs not just necessarily like on the job but just as a whole person having access to these things so yeah 
And um, Marcy, you already mentioned a few of the sort of on the job safety risks. I'm curious if there are some that you see as being like more immediate, uh, more dangerous than others. Uh, I hate to say like more dangerous than others because obviously like every hazard is, you know, something that it directly impacts people's um, safety and well-being. But are there things that uh, you see as being the biggest job safety risks currently for recycling workers? Yeah, well, there was um, some recent um, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that came out that uh, highlighted that recycling work uh, is, is uh, the sixth deadliest industry and that uh, injury rates are high and, and rising. It rose from 3.6 per 100,000 workers in 2019 to 5.2. So that's, that's significant. And the vast majority of both the workforce and those that are suffering are people of color, African-American, black and brown workers, you know, again, temp workers, people that are uh, in many cases historically have been lured into the, some of the worst jobs uh, pretty intentionally knowing that they uh, uh, may or may not speak up. And so we're trying to change that dynamic. But in terms of types of hazards, you know, in, in, in this industry, people work often work very long hours and, and it's backbreaking work, uh, leaning over conveyor belts, sorting materials, pulling out often hazardous materials, working with heavy equipment, climbing onto large conveyor belts, bailers to clean and having to clean out these machinery. Um, and there's you know, loud noises, dust exposure, extreme temperatures. And also um, we've also found that there's a lot of chemicals that tend to be sometimes mixed together in these bins where it could cause both an exposure but also potential for explosions. And what's, what's really daunting is that most of these exposures could be addressed and the, the health and um, safety dangers really mitigated. Uh, you know, and there's many ways that, that could be done. First and foremost, having workers at the table developing a comprehensive safety plan with their employers uh, where they are not afraid to speak up when they see that something's at risk, uh, where they can be trained in, in the language that they speak uh, and where if there's a near miss, it's reported. So there's many, many measures that could be taken. But unfortunately, again, when you, you know, are, uh, not in a situation where you're using all the tools in the toolbox of, of safety and health and you're putting workers at, at deadly risk. Yeah, and um, as we've kind of touched on a little earlier, um, in addition to these um, on the job risks that have been risks for the whole time people have had these jobs, we also have the added complication in the last few years of COVID and all of the uh, COVID safety risks. So um, this is a question for both of you. I'm just curious from your perspectives, um, just sort of how um, workers are experiencing COVID on the job. Um, COVID, um, maybe not necessarily they're getting infected, but just how they're experiencing like their access to PPE, their access to uh, vaccines and sort of what, either solutions you're seeing that are sort of helping to protect them against COVID and what are the, um, you know, things that are not happening um, in these arenas. So I'm not sure who would like to go first, but I'm curious to hear both of your perspectives on that. Um, Marcy, do you want, do you want me to, to start with that one? Sure. Um, so from my perspective, um, working with the informal sector, um, you know, I do recognize um, that you know, waste waste work is inherently um, is, is inherently dangerous and you know creating a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, and um, for waste workers in countries within the global south, countries who've um, you know come out of in a long era of colonization, um, a lot of the waste, the vast majority of waste workers in, in these countries across Africa, across Latin America, across Asia. Um, are informally employed, which means they don't have that um, traditional employer employee relationship. So they're, you know, they're even more vulnerable um, because they, they, you know, there are no standards that they need to, that, that, that are enforced um, in that context to, to, you know, uphold occupational health and safety. 
And during COVID, um, that of course uh, has been especially problematic. So we've seen lots um, around workers um, in various different contexts, just not having any access to PPE, not having any masks, um, gloves, um, you know, aprons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot um, in terms of local authorities and national governments, you know, really not making much effort at all to, to rectify that by providing PPE. Um, and so failing that workers have, have, have sort of, uh, they've had the, all of the risk downloads onto them um, and, you know, really taken on this burden of having to source um, and fund PPE themselves, um, you know, taking out loans, um, digging into their savings, um, you know, amongst, you know, in a context where they're already suffering a lot because they're working less, um, you know, they're li you know, they're working and living under conditions where they're facing increased exposure to, to infectious diseases, including COVID. Um, you know, we, we are seeing um, um, organized, organized groups of workers, whether that's trade unions or worker cooperatives, um, stepping up, um, offering mutual aid to waste pickers and reclaimers um, in different areas of the world. So, you know, this is around not just you know, helping to educate um, workers on how to, you know, how best in their context they can prevent COVID infection, but this is also, you know, providing them with PPE as well. Um, but of course, you know, this is very much, um, this is very much, um, just a really insufficient um, and unsustainable situation, um, especially because a lot of the PPE is single use, you know, masks and gloves are designed to be used once and once only. Um, so there's only so much that these organized groups of workers can do. And there's only so much PPE that workers themselves can fund themselves. Um, and so you inevitably have, um, you know, workers, ending up using PPE multiple times, of course, understandably, because it's so expensive and it's also um, just generally hard to access, um, especially when supply chains have been disrupted um, due to COVID. Um, so I would say that, you know, while we've really seen workers um, show up for themselves and show up for each other, and that's so important um, in the absence of um, people with real power, you know, actually trying to, to support their people, you know, these responses are so important, but they're not at all sustainable. Um, and that's why now more than ever, we really, really, really need um, that input from local authorities and other governmental structures um, to really assume um, this responsibility and, and, and really take care of waste workers world over. Christy's description completely resonates with what we've seen in the United States, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning, uh, you know, and workers continue to work shoulder to shoulder uh, in the face of a pandemic without access to protective equipment, with, uh, you know, without proper ventilation, which is really a critical, you know, mitigating factor, you know, without the barriers that, um, that you know, could, could separate them, engineering controls sort of thing. And, you know, certainly without any comprehensive safety plans, which, engage workers at the table. And, you know, again, from the very beginning, our federal government completely abandoned workers. Our Federal Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, said from the beginning, you know, we are not going to be citing employers related to um, the pandemic, related to the infection, you know, related to COVID. And uh, workers were forced to fend for themselves. And, you know, on the one hand, they were called essential, like finally, workers were recognized that we can't live without them. We can't live without their food and without their services. And yet, you know, our government was abandoning them and, you know, calling them essential on the one hand and then ignoring them. But workers themselves, as Christy described, you know, came together collectively in larger numbers than ever before. Um, some organizing for a union with new, new types of unions forming in the United States and also taking to the streets and saying, enough already. I mean, I am, you know, putting my family's lives at risk, not only my own, my whole community. 
And you need to be doing something together with us. The employers need to take action. Our government needs to protect us. And so we've seen, like Christy said, those, those polls of you know, complete abandonment, but at the same time, this increased building of power. And so what, you know, when we, we've had a new administration and they've taken the pandemic more seriously, but there's so much more that, that they could be doing as well. Um, they did not enact a, a comprehensive protective standard for, for workers as well, uh, but we're continuing to, you know, urge them to take more action. Um, and, you know, again, with, you know, in the United States, they called it striketober. We want that to be all year long where workers are seen and heard and at the table. And, uh, you know, we, in uh, a few months ago, our whole movement launched an agenda, a blueprint for what do we need to be protecting workers? What do employers need to do? What does our government need to do? And we're gonna continue to assert that until workers are truly respected beyond the pandemic, not just during the pandemic. Yeah, Marcy, you're talking about the sort of tension in the US and I imagine this is maybe similar in other countries where it's like, oh yes, these workers are essential, like we need them. Um, but we're also maybe not giving them essential services. And um, I know, Christy, when we were talking a couple of days ago, you had mentioned that for waste pickers, there's sort of this um, in certain areas, um, maybe a misunderstanding about that job or maybe some misconceptions that have actually kind of contributed to making their job a little bit more dangerous in certain cases. Can you talk a little bit more about that and sort of what that tension is? Sure. So, I mean, waste pickers are subject to, um, well, waste pickers, um, as well as a, a whole array of other um, sort of informal sector occupations are just subject to so many, so many mis, uh, misrepresentations and, and, and it contributes a lot of stigma and it just further um, kind of reproduces that marginalization, which comes um, inherently to to that work um, in that context. Um, so for waste for waste pickers and reclaimers um, specifically, there is this perception that they um, can, you know, they are they can carry disease and they've been exposed to all kinds of um, things. You know, especially if you're handling sort of medical waste, um, contaminated waste, human waste, uh, and so. You know there is yeah there is this perception from um, other members of the public that you know it's, it's kind of associated with dirt you know dirtiness and uh, lack of hygiene um, um, you know which is just so sad because you know it's obviously true that some waste pickers um, you know do handle those 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 forms of waste um, and are indeed exposed to really dangerous things. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, as in, as as individuals or even as a collective, are in, you know are somehow um, spreading disease. Um, and actually, we at Wego we've we've done some research um, in multiple waves, um, um, a longitudinal study where we've um, we've been assessing the impact of the pandemic on various different occupational groups, including waste pickers, um, at certain times of throughout the throughout the pandemic, and you know, waste pickers are indeed um, exposed um, to to various diseases, including COVID. You know, waste pickers, you know, do talk about this stigmatization, but we're not see we're not necessarily seeing um, higher rates of infection. Um, well, knowingly being infected, uh, and, and, and you know, of course, that comes with that's more likely to happen if you have symptoms. But we're not really seeing um, that kind of high rate of positivity positivity um, for COVID specifically within waste pickers. It's not as if, um, you know, they are, they are essentially, you know, carrying lots more COVID than other work groups. That's, that's just not what we've seen from our data. And we've, we've, you know, we've surveyed thousands of, of workers um, all across the world in 12 cities, in fact. Um, so, you know, that just reinforces, um, you know, not just that these things are very dangerous, um, but also the, these ideas are very dangerous, but also that it's just simply not true. Um, but nevertheless, um, even though that's not uh, a true assertion to make, um, we still absolutely need those protections for waste pickers. Um, 
and and you know that always has to remain our focus yeah thanks for that um and we had a question in the chat about um from Demetra. she was uh was mentioning um a manual from Greece for Waste City Pickers and Geo and some of the resources that they offer. And Dimitri was asking about other um, resources that maybe um, you could either suggest or things that might also sort of help um, be a resource guide for, for others. Is that something that either of you have experience with and things that you would offer? So we um, we have on our website a range of um, uh, resources on safety and health from you know for a range of industries and types of workers, and so there's some that are specific to COVID to sort of um, help address some of the that the the hazards and strategies that could be used, and then there's more broadly. Um, but in addition, what is a really key focus of ours is how do we uh, build the voices and power of workers to take action? So often it's not like a, a one-shot deal where we could say, here's the hazard in your workplace, just get rid of it. What really is needed is a process of having workers sitting down and what can they do? What are the steps that they can take to be identifying what are the exposures that they have and what do they see as priorities and how can they document them? How do they set up a reporting system? How do they have an ongoing health and safety committee? So we have a lot of resources that are focused on workers coming together, taking collective action and having an ongoing voice at the table for new hazards that might arise. Um, so that's, we have, we have a lot of that and happy to uh, follow up after this uh, webinar. Great. Um, I also wanted to uh, circle back on something that both of you had touched on, which is sort of some of the regulatory um, aspects or lack of regulations um, that are meant to protect workers. Um, I'm curious in both of your sectors, if you see um, any kind of recent changes to laws or regulations that you think um, have actually benefited workers in your sectors or maybe um, also some areas that you feel are, are shortfalls that um, you think either local, state, federal, national, international laws should be updated. Sorry, Megan, could you repeat the question? Sure, I'm just curious about um, relevant either regulations or laws um, that you see as being particularly helpful to workers in this sector. Um, I know for you, you've said that there's uh, like by nature of being an informal worker, that's not always the case. But if there's anything that you are seeing that you feel like is a positive step in a regulatory or um, you know law framework that you could highlight or areas where you think there's obviously um, updates and changes that need to be made. So this is a very interesting question because uh, you know, as you've uh, as you've rightly um, highlighted, um, the problem inherent to informal work is that, by by definition, um, the 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 formal regulations uh, around occupational health and safety that may exist in some countries just do not include them. They don't. They they in in so many ways exclude them which means that um, th that also means that there is no, um, I suppose there's no, that, you know, local authorities feel that there's no need uh, to then, um, you know, intervene and um, uphold um, the inherent human right to, you know, to health and safety, um, just because there is no sort of legal instrument available. Um, I don't necessarily know. I don't necessarily know the um, the specifics um, because I because I am not a lawyer. But we do have a law program at WeGo who definitely deal with some of these issues. Um, but it's just it's, it's the reason why it's so tough is just because those those limited instruments that do exist just do not just do not um, have any kind of um, you know, inclusion of um, 
workers who are informally employed and that includes the vast 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 majority of waste workers so it's really really difficult so it's true in the united states that if you are in the informal sector if you are out sort of picking waste um then it is true that you would be sort of outside the system um there are however many many industries that are in the system you know recycling facilities um, and other waste uh, facilities that um, are and can be uh, uh, have much more uh, protections for workers. And so, um, you know, I mentioned there's federal OSHA, which is the, the main safety agency in the United States. And they don't have any like one regulation related to an entire industry per se. It's more, you know, piecemeal. So you've got protections if you're in a confined space or if you are um, at risk of being exposed to a needle stick, uh, a needle um, exposure. So there are individual um, protections and then there's like a general overall, which is called the general duty clause. So OSHA is one agency. And again, you know, as I mentioned during the pandemic, there, there was no comprehensive protection for workers, no requirements that an employer create a safety and health plan with their workers um, if they're not in healthcare specifically. That was the one um, regulation that we we're appreciative that, that got enacted. So let's set aside federal OSHA for the moment, though again, if there are if there are major dangers, certainly workers can use OSHA as one strategy. They shouldn't use it alone because again, it's important to be working collectively and using as many actions to, to ensure the employer moves forward. But the other level that we start to talk about is who is funding um, recycling. And in many cases, there are municipalities that are putting a lot of resources towards recycling. So what can they be doing? Well, um, they could be enacting measures where they require certain levels of safety. And in Southern California, for example, our Southern California Kosh Group, along with their allies, worked and did get an ordinance passed where you have to be certified at a certain safety level in order to operate. Um, there are other, other measures that could be taken, eliminating temp work, making sure that all workers are permanent employees, uh, ensuring that workers have the right to unionize, that they could just simply start, sign a card check if they wanna be part of a union and make it easy to have to be at the table. That's all that, that unionization means is that having a voice, being able to collectively bargain. And then one other just really basic area that we had a recent victory in our region is that the recycling industry was so powerful that they got themselves exempted from a living wage ordinance. Um, and so for, for years and years, workers were being paid minimum wage instead of a living wage. And finally, over the last year, that is now in the greater Boston area, workers have a, a higher wage as a result of the municipalities using the pressure that they have, they've got leverage and they should be using it. Great, I think that um, that's an interesting segue into another question I have where both of you have also talked about sort of the, um, you know, the worker advocacy piece of this job. And um, this is obviously gonna look different for your different sectors, but I'm curious about um, some of the community organizing sort of the worker advocacy piece, um, how that plays into um, creating safer uh, workplaces just from a, a worker perspective and what kind of um, actions that workers themselves are, are being able to take. Um, you'd mentioned unionizing, Mercy, but i um, curious about other, um, other things. Um, do you want me to start and then jump to Christy? Um, to a little different this time. So, um, you know, so the, frankly, the, the, what is the gold standard really should be the basic standard, which is, you know, I mentioned by having a union, you simply have a, an ability to sit down at the table and collectively bargain. And when there are, you know, conditions that need to be changed, you can appeal and you've got, you've got, you know, measures and means to do it. Um, so that's, you know, again, what, what, 
needs to be happening uh, in, in as many companies as possible, but sort of the, the next best thing is collective action and having the ability to work together uh, with workers if you're not unionized and to use all of the strategies that you can. And so with Kosh, we have sort of a process of engaging workers where we bring together as many workers as possible in the same workplace and we have them identify what it is that they are concerned about. What are the big issues in their workplace? And it doesn't have to be strictly health and safety because uh, it's overall working conditions, it's wages, it's discrimination or, or sexual harassment or violence or all the things that make up you know, working conditions. And then having them go through a process of conditions and developing their own strategy of what is it that's going to take to get their employer to change? What sort of leverage do they have? Um, is it that they just simply can go to the employer with a letter and the employer will say, sure, I'm going to make that change? Or do they need to step one level further, bring together allies in the community and collectively put pressure? Is it that they need to go to the customers and say, do you know what's happening to your, you know, to the people that are serving you? Can you support us? And again, with the customers, I mentioned that in, in the case of recycling, you often have elected officials or city officials. So there's a number of steps that that we that we typically take, um, and it's led by the workers determining what do they need, what do they want to do, and how can we support them. Christine, what about you? Um, I probably won't have much more to add um, to what Marcy was saying, just because, um, I, I mean, I'm a public health specialist, so this isn't necessarily, um, so I suppose like looking at the ways that waste pickers organize isn't necessarily my area of expertise, um, but what I can tell you is um, just kind of expand on the ways in which um, um, organized um, groups of waste pickers uh, and reclaimers have um, sort of really stepped um, stepped stepped up, um, you know, and and stood up for um, for their members. Um, so I mentioned about how um, um, you know cooperatives and trade union groups of of um, waste workers have been doing things like um, you know, educating, helping to educate on health prevention, you know, helping to promote um, optimal health and safety practices. You know, distributing things like PPE, even um, during COVID, um, also distributing things like um, thermometers so that they can measure their temperature um, at landfills um, and, and various other um, other sites. Um, but one major thing that I've been seeing um, with, with with my work is um, the ways in which um, organised groups of um, have workers have really mobilised when it comes to vaccination. So. Um, I've been managing um, our work, I've been co-managing our work on um, access to, well, advocating for access to vaccination um, for um, various groups of informal workers. And um, we have great examples, for example, from um, Argentina, there's a huge um, trade union called UTEP and they've been fantastic um, in, um, first of all, advocating for for waste workers and other informal workers to be seen um, as essential, so to really be given um, um, to be given sort of that status as um, essential workers, and that um, in some contexts, including in Argentina, has been quite pivotal um, because once you've kind of been got some level of recognition um, as an essential worker it then makes things like getting access to vaccination easier because of course um, we would have seen in different country contexts there are um, kind of priority groups um, so for example you know quite understandably health workers and the elderly um, but also in, in you know in places like Argentina they've they've really made that argument that waste workers and other workers and, and various other informal workers um, should really be included you know in that category um, just because of the you know the nature of what they do and the level of risk that they face um you know they're exposed and yet they're so unprotected um and um 
yeah, our, our, our partners at have been fantastic in, you know, rallying, you know, get, you know, really pushing this sort of narrative, um, you know, at governmental level and rallying um, a lot of their workers around vaccination, you know, educating workers around why this is important, not just for, you know, your health and, you know, the health of your, your family, your community, but also, you know, this is about livelihoods. You know, you need to be healthy to, to have a life, to, to work and earn a livelihood for your family. So this is really about economic rights as well. Um, we've also got um, um, partners in, in Brazil um, who did a lot of similar work um, to Argentina, but, you know, it had a massive, um, you know, educational focus. They managed to vaccinate, I think, 2,000 people, uh, two, almost 2,000 people in two days, um, 2,000 waste workers in two days. Um, some, and some of those workers, you know, had lost family members, you know, to COVID um, and it really, really meant a lot. And it was very, very powerful and very emotional for them. And we also have, um, you know, great work happening in South Africa with African Reclaimers Organization. Um, so you've got the workers who work predominantly with recycled materials and, 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 and um, you know, they've been doing so much great advocacy work, um, for example, um, because lots of the waste workers there um, are um, non-South African. So th there is quite a large population of workers from other parts of Southern Africa, particularly Zimbabwe, um, which um, obviously shares a border with South Africa. And um, there are a lot of waste workers who are undocumented, don't, don't necessarily have um, paperwork. And, you know, so the question of, you know, vaccinate, of vaccination becomes really tricky because there is this sort of belief that, um, you know, if I, I don't have paperwork, I therefore can't register. Or even if, um, you know, in theory, they can register, it's kind of that contact with the state, you know, making yourself visible to the state when you when you know that you don't necessarily have um the required immigration papers and, and everything that, that that comes with all those fears and all that stigma uh, and that's been a real barrier but you know that organization um on the ground have been doing a lot of work with their members um to to really you know advocate um for the rights of you know of workers who don't have their papers so you know this it's just been you know in particular for this issue, it's been so, so, so crucial um, in terms of, you know, in terms of getting much needed support where quite frankly, uh, the government are just absent. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, the kind of concept of mutual aid for waste workers, um, particularly in the global South has, is, is just an absolute lifeline. And um, we are at WeGo, um, you know, continuing to work with, with these organizations and strengthening them so that they ultimately can, um, you know, offer more support and, 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 you know, really kind of be in the best position to, to take up their fights um, with local authorities and, and other governmental structures. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, just like the power of kind of kind of just the community organizing sector and in, in place of having, you know, these more formal structures, I think is really interesting. And um, I think, um, Marcy, did you have something that you wanted to add about that as well? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say, I, you know, it's so inspiring, uh, heart wrenching, but inspiring to hear uh, about about the network that, that you have, Christy. It's just, you know, on the one hand, uh, just so traumatic what, what's, what's been happening. And, and on the other hand, just the way that, that, that organizations and individuals have stepped up. And it's true that, um, that our affiliates around the country, they're, they're worker-based organizations, and they've had a pivot to community actions and the mutual aid that you mentioned, Christy, uh, you know, going to set up vaccine centers and having uh, raising funds so that people can eat um, and to pay their rent. And so it's a real, it's been a real shift and you, they've had to do both duty of, of the sort of, you know, basic human needs as well as addressing all these heartbreaking health and safety issues. Um, one other thing I, I, I wanted to mention is that um, we've also seen um, not, you know, just in the last couple of years, but over the last few years, some innovative models 
uh, as Christy mentioned as well in the United States. Um, in Massachusetts, um, folks from the Massachusetts Worker Center and from uh, a, another organization joined together to create a worker-owned cooperative that um, was working in partnership with initially restaurants, Latino owned and African-American owned, where they would have to pay so much money to get rid of their waste. Um, and it was, you know, it was not as sustainable. And so what they were doing is going to these, these restaurants, picking up their waste, converting it to compost. And so they were they they have this now fairly flourishing uh, a cooperative called Cerro uh, that uh, is going to different establishments and and doing this work and creating composting. But it's all worker owned, and that means that they create their own conditions, that they create um, the wages and benefits. And so these sorts of models are are really critical as well. Cool. And I wanted to remind everyone that um, we're open to questions. So uh, definitely let us know what's on your mind. Uh, I did want to take another question. This is from Cole, my colleague. Um, and he was curious about sort of the role that automation plays in, um, in you know, reducing safety uh, issues. I know that this is obviously going to be different across the board, but in terms of, you know, recycling facilities, waste facilities, um, you know, what kind of, what role does this like automated equipment kind of play? And is this something that people have access to? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, I would say because we focus um, on the global South, so, you know, countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, I'm not entirely sure if I suppose the automation question applies as much in those contexts. That doesn't mean it's not relevant, but from what I've seen, um, that doesn't necessarily appear to, or at least appear to be one of the sort of headline concerns, because of course, in, in so many ways, um, the things that waste workers are dealing with um, in these contexts are just, in, in, so, in so many ways, just a lot more basic. Um, th that, I, I, I predict that that will, um, you know, change in the coming years, that, you know, it will become a much more urgent question. But from what I've seen, it's not something that's that we've really dug into, um, but we will have to dig into that, um, with time, I think. And in the US, it's absolutely growing um, that there's more automation in many sectors. And the, the, the issue that, that, that we feel is that, you know, it's, it's maybe the case that in certain arenas it, uh, that robots could do some of the more hazardous jobs. But what's happening is that there's no space again for labor workers to be sitting at the table to be looking at, you know, what are the roles that they are taking on and are there new hazards that are being created? We've seen many instances where the robots have caused things to fall on workers. And there was, you know, once where a uh, bear spray, you know, got stabbed in a, in a store where, where workers got very, very sick. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that robots are going to be inherently make the workplace more dangerous, but they create new hazards. And again, workers need to be at the table looking at what are the new conditions that are being created. So that's part one. Part two is if robots are going to be taking jobs from workers, um, then we need to have a whole shift in how we look at our economy. Um, you know, if, if, Work, if there's a less need for humans to work as many hours, well, then maybe we need to be reducing the work week and continuing to pay workers, you know, what they deserve um, and what they need in order to, to, you know, live a healthy life. Uh, so we need to be really thinking about if there is going to be a shift that we need to be looking more holistically. Uh, we need to be thinking about if, if workers have fewer hours, are they working multiple jobs and what does that mean for benefits? How do we ensure that workers are not dependent on this one full-time job 
that may be shrinking if there's more automation uh, and that they can have those, those urgently needed benefits, health and uh, retirement and, and, and all these things. So again, it's a question of ensuring that workers and labor at the table, you know, looking for a, a higher quality of life for everyone. Great. And we have another audience question from Joe who is asking, if we can shift cultural perception of waste from being just waste to being a resource, does the panel think this can help improve conditions for workers? Look, I'll jump in first this time. Um, so I think that's exactly that example that I gave of Cerro, the um, zero waste, Cerro means zero, zero waste um, company that was created worker owned. Um, they looked at trash as an opportunity to create compost. So in many instances, we are gonna find that, that there are opportunities to uh, turn waste into something that is of value. Um, and we've seen more and more companies that are using you know, chopsticks that are being turned into, I don't even know what, but, um, but that in and of itself, this innovation isn't going to change working conditions unless it's an intentional effort to say, hey, we're going to be improving our world. We're going to reduce climate change. We're going to uh, improve our environment. So let's look at the environment as, as the whole being, as both you know, the, 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 the sky and the trees, as well as the human beings inside of it. And how can we ensure that the conditions of life are better for workers? So it can't just be simply having new innovative businesses which in and of itself are, could be a good thing, um, but it's looking at the whole economy and how do we have workers at the table. I don't necessarily have much to, to add to, to what Marcy was saying, but I definitely agree that, you know, that, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I think it's very reasonable to argue that um, that sort of cultural aspects, you know, can, can shift in some way. So, you know, we know that, um, from our experience on the on, on the grounds that um, you know, trying to share this image of you know workers actually reclaiming something and turning it into something else that's also of use and that's also inherently valuable um, is is something so powerful. I mean, even I you know I mentioned um, Africa Reclaimers Organization. Um, earlier, um, the organization based in South Africa, um, they don't call themselves waste pickers. They call themselves, in fact, there are, in fact, um, I'm not sure if this is across the board, but from um, the members of um, African Reclaimers Organization who I've met, um, they absolutely hate uh, the word waste pickers or waste workers because they don't see it as, they don't perceive what they're collecting as waste. They see value and, and you know, obviously we should all see value um, but the workers, it starts with the workers and the workers themselves see these things as being inherently value, valuable and they make money off them. They make an entire, they build an entire livelihood which supports their entire family and, you know, their whole communities of, of reclaimers and waste pickers and waste workers who, who you know, work in, in work and live um, in a community of other um, waste workers, waste pickers, reclaimers. Um, and you know this is this is the work that sustains that entire community, um, and you know gets gets children to school, gets them access to healthcare, um, you know gets them some savings, gets some food. So I think yeah, you know it's just another example of all the things that the world can learn from workers, especially workers um, in you know really precarious jobs and workers in the global south. You know that. This is not waste, um, it, and we we can't see it as waste because <laughs> there are pe there are people, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people around the planet who literally rely on that waste and turn it into something that's so useful for us and for our environment. So yeah, I it was just to say that I think that we have a lot to learn from from them, um, and yeah, I think that cultural shift will will definitely be something um, really, really important um, in terms of our perception in the future of people that work in this industry. 
Yeah, thanks for that. And that's actually also a really important thing I hadn't thought about was um, just because I'm I'm not as familiar um, with the race reclaimer industry. So that's like the language that we use to talk about these jobs is really important. Um, you know, if we're seeing um, the the items that are being collected as a resource and not as necessarily waste, how are we talking about that? You know, what what kind of um, perception are we kind of putting on that when we discuss it? So um, yeah, that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind also for me as a reporter too, how I talk about it. So. Um, and I'm also curious too, because um, we have just a few minutes left. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but these are your last opportunities um, to ask your last burning questions. But one thing I wanted to ask both of you, we've already talked a little bit about some of the solutions that you've seen, um, ways that workers have um, organized uh, things that have been somewhat effective strategies so far. Are there other things that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet that you're seeing as being really uh, effective ways that are making improvements in worker safety. Um, and maybe also, um, maybe I'll start with Christy on this one because I know that you do cover areas that are not just um, waste reclaimers. And maybe, I don't know if there are examples from other informal economies um, that you've seen, um, how they've um, tackled safety issues that you feel like could be templates for other industries or um, just other examples that you could think of. So um, I would say, I mean, of course, this is, you know, it's it's just such a huge issue <laughs> for pretty much every um, sort of informal occupation. Um, just, just inherently, it's just so problematic and it's just such a huge, the, the, you know, the barriers to sort of overcome this are just so impossibly huge. <laughs> um well I shouldn't I probably shouldn't say impossible um it's definitely not impossible it's just it's just incredibly difficult um but I would say if if there's something that we could learn from other sort of contexts other um occupations so we engaged with a project um in South Africa is in Durban which is um by the coast um in the south of South Africa um and it was I think it was about four or five years ago. And it was a project that was co-produced um, in Durban. So that it was, it was, a, a, it was a, a collaboration between some academics at the local university, um, some local NGOs, um, and also um, a lot of street vendors um, who were selling various items and particularly food and, and, and um, various meats and, and stuff like that. And they created um, like a committee um, where workers had equal representation, um, they would go around in this committee um, and you know share the concerns of of, of other workers um, with academics, with um, with NGOs, and then this committee would then um, convene meetings um, where you had kind of like sort of the academic perspective, you had the NGO perspective, then you had the the real sort of work of realities conveyed. Um, in meetings with local authorities and municipalities. And, and um, uh, that was actually very, very productive. Um, I think it resulted in um, some funds being allocated and, and like workers, for example, um, being able to better access healthcare because um, they arranged for um, local medical students or junior doctors to come to the like the actual work site, well, the, the, the markets and, um, you know, do health assessments. And, you know, all of this to say that basically bringing together all of these different sort of um, corners, uh, all these different um, actors together from all different corners who um, shared concerns about um, occupational health and safety for street vendors um, actually did result in something that, um, you know, was dignified and um, that workers, um, you know, helped to shape and were very much involved and consulted in. Um, and I think that's, a, and, and I think essentially, you know, there's a lot to learn because it has to be that way. We have to do things that consult and actively include workers. Um, so I, I think there's there's a lot that we can kind of take from that that can be applied to, to waste workers um, in very different contexts, to be honest. 
Great. And we have like uh, like 30 seconds left. I don't know, Marcy, if you want to really quickly wrap it up. And I'm just going to say, yes, Christy, <laughs> because that's that's been true uh, here as well. You know, needless to say, um, across the United States, there's been new opportunities for worker councils, worker committees. Uh, some have been done by actual ordinance. Some have been just, we're coming together. Uh, you know, to take collective action in partnership with our allies and labor and, and worker centers and cash groups. So ditto. And uh, we're just excited for moving to a new place where workers are at the center and leading the way for change. Uh, Megan, you're muted. You know, it had to happen at some point. Thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. Thanks so much for everyone that tuned in. Um, if we didn't get to your question, it looks like there's one question left. Um, is there a way we can um, put uh, both of your contact information in the chat maybe, and then um, kind of connect offline? But um, other than that, I learned a lot. I really appreciate everything that we were chatting about today. And um, thanks and have a good rest of your week. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you, Marcy. And thank you, Christy. Thanks a lot for taking the time towards like what's the holiday season for everyone at this point in time. Uh, thanks to the audience as well. And I've already dropped the links to uh, both the websites on chat. So you can go have a look at it. And if you, you can always write to us at connectedwastewise.be and we will connect you to the speakers. And uh, if you haven't watched any of our other webinars, please go to the video panel section and sign up to our newsletter to know more about future webinars. Thanks a lot. Happy holidays. We will see you in 2022. Bye-bye.